your relationship to sex is about so much more than just fucking. It's about your relationship to your body and your relationship to yourself. Building that relationship and exploring your relationship to your body is the kind of first most important step to creating a sex life outside of the context of partnership. And up until that point, I'd never spoken about sex really openly. I had a really bad relationship to sex. I wasn't able to orgasm in partnered sex. And I just had a really bad relationship to sex. And I just didn't think I was a sexual person at all. I was just like, it's just not my thing. On today's episode, the founder and host of Sex Talks, broadcaster and writer, Emma Louise Boynton. Emma, thank you so Hi. much for joining me today. Yes. I'm super excited to have you. Yes. I will let you introduce yourself for this yes. one time because I know that you can do that sensationally well. I actually, I love that. I really like when people introduce themselves because I think it's always interesting to note what people bring up about mm. themselves that might not actually be in their bio. So um, my name is Emma Louise Boynton and I am a writer, a presenter and the founder and host of Sex Talks, which is a platform that exists to engender more honest, open and vulnerable conversations around typically taboo topics. So we talk a lot about sex, relationships, the future of intimacy. Um, and I really see sex primarily as the prism through which we can explore a myriad of socio-political issues from gender inequality to body image issues to everything because so much shows up in the context of sex. How we relate to sex, how we feel about sex, our ideas about sex, how we, the anxieties we might bring into sex, they reflect so many broader things that are happening in the wider world and our lives more broadly. So I think it's a really interesting um, access point to have those bigger conversations with people. And obviously sex is such a universal topic. We're mm. all having it or and you're not having a taboo it. topic at exactly. the same time. Exactly, so mm. so I love talking about things that typically, I guess, make people blush or feel a bit uncomfortable because I really don't feel uncomfortable about things like that. So I just love the answer to like probe it and poke it and be like, but why, but why, but why, but why, but why? That's like the running joke of my family that I'm just like, why? But why? Why, why, why though? Why? 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 Yeah. So yeah, that is me. Amazing. Amazing. I, I, I want to talk about everything at the same right. time. Okay. So first of all, how do you not get nervous or how are you able to be so vulnerable about talking? I imagine you spoke, speak about your own mm -hmm. sex life as well. Mm. How? Well, first and foremost, I would never have thought I would be talking about sex mm. as part of my job previously. So I started my career in politics. I did, um, I worked at a think tank initially when I was doing my masters and then went into the newsrooms. I was working in news for about five years. Freelance, producer. Uh, I loved it and I hated it. I love, I mean, I'm still really like politically engaged. I read a lot. I read the news a lot. I listen to so many podcasts. Um, I really want to do, start doing more charity i've got a couple of things i'm working on at the moment charities i want to align sex talks with that stuff's always been really important to me especially anything around gender inequality but i think i um yeah so i loved it and i loved that like the fast metabolism of well, like sorry the fast-paced nature of, of news i found it such an invigorating environment to work in i loved feeling that i was on the front line of mm. politics and you know i worked in millbank which is the really near here actually yeah um where sky news when i was at sky news and actually worked at bbc there and you're literally opposite westminster where everything happens. politicking is happen happening but i think the frustration point was that i really cared about the stuff certain issues of what we were talking about and i didn't feel sufficiently able to do anything about it and be mm. involved and i think for me there was always that that was a point of tension whereby i knew that long term I would ultimately find it unsatisfying to only ever be have my nose pressed against the window of mm -hmm. Westminster and not actually be involved in trying to change anything or be a part of any sort of movement for change and I think that's where everything has happened since and particularly sex talks now it's still a media company so it's still very much like asking questions and I interview lots of people and host events I'm writing a book proposal at the moment but I feel like the conversations we're having are really important and very necessary ones that haven't necessarily been had before and I feel like I'm able to help people to make changes in their life with regards to how they see themselves their body 
their relationship to sex. Mm. And I think in turn, that has a really big ripple effect in the rest of people's lives. And so I feel like I've managed to create something that allows me to straddle both still satiating that newsy media version of myself, loving interviewing, loving speaking to people, uh, loving researching, all of that, whilst also feeling that I'm being more kind of active and I'm addressing issues I think are important. I'm tackling taboos I think are damaging to us collectively and obviously always trying to bring in that, not trying, I think bringing in that gender inequality piece and addressing how do our, how's our relationship to sex to our bodies, how is that reflective of the kind of broader gender inequality issues that we face? That's all to say, you asked me initially why you think I'm able to be, uh, not get nervous around talking about this sort of stuff. I did sex therapy five years, no, five years ago, two years ago, um, which I was running a different business at the time. I was working as a, just started as a founding editor at this amazing women's network called The Stack. And I started doing sex therapy at that time on the recommendation of two friends. And up until that point, I'd never spoken about sex really openly. I had a really bad relationship to sex. I wasn't able to orgasm in partnered sex um, for like seven years. It was mm. what, once I broke up with my one long time boyfriend that was ages ago. And I just had a really bad relationship to sex. I just didn't think I was a sexual person at all. I was just like, it's just not my thing. And did sex therapy. And Which I think, by the way, is very <laughs> relatable to very many women. Most women who come to sex talks tell me that. So I want, I want to hear that transformation. Yeah. Like that, but. Oh my gosh, I absolutely will, will go into that. But I think on the, once I began talking to a sex therapist about issues, I thought I was very alone in experiencing around sexual dysfunction, around anxiety, around sex, all these sorts of things. And once we began to break down the shame I felt around sex and dig deep into how my relationship to my body had affected sex, the experience of sexual assault had affected it, all those sort of things. Once I began to do that, it really helped to unpick the shame I felt around a topic that for me had always been quite off bounds. Mm. And a bit like kind of exercising a muscle, I just got much better at talking in the context of a therapy room, my, th talking about my relationship to sex and like the dynamics that played out there. And after the back that, uh, once I finished doing sex therapy, I was like, this is wild how transformative those conversations were for me in my life, but how seldom we get the opportunity to have those sorts of conversations in our day-to-day -day lives, how taboo this topic remains. And that's what prompted me to set up sex talks. Mm -hmm. And I think just by virtue of continuing to talk about it more, I just have like now it just is not, doesn't feel wrong off or, or embarrassing. weird not yeah. at all and it's so I think it was just that exercise and that muscle and I think doing that first and foremost in the therapy room was a really important kind of breakthrough way of me doing that I definitely wouldn't be running this and wouldn't be having these conversations so openly if it wasn't for that Hi everyone, today's episode is sponsored by Momo Kombucha my favorite non-alcoholic drink together with water I've now been drinking Momo Kombucha for around six months and I really love their product because they're healthy, they're delicious, they keep coming out with these new flavors and limited editions, watermelon that I tried recently that I was obsessed with. So if you wanna try Momo Kombucha and you haven't yet, feel free to use the discount code ISTHESIT15 to get a 15% discount off your first order. Absolutely fascinating. And I think by you having these conversations and being so comfortable of discussing these intimate things and situations on camera with other people, it gives permission and example to other people that this is how it can be. It doesn't have to be this, you know, very shameful thing because a lot of us, I mean, including myself, we grew up in, you know, a, I wouldn't say a strict household, but a very... Um, classically closed when it comes to sexuality. So it's not discussed, it's not debated. You turn away when people are kissing on TV and all those sorts of things. And so having somebody that you um, look up to or somebody that you perceive is similar to you, your age, just being so free about it, I think is setting a very good example. Totally. And I mean, I grew up in a house where we did not talk about sex. Mm. My mum my, she really gets annoyed at me saying this now, but it's definitely is true. When I was like 10, I had this diary. No, I put together this folder of all these pictures of Draco Malfoy from Harry Potter, who I was in love with. And one night I remember just showing my mom this folder being like, I'm in love with Draco Malfoy. Like I'm gonna marry him, like all this sort of stuff. And she just turned off the light as she was leaving my room. And she was like, you mustn't have sex until you're 18. And that was my like, <laughs> and that was our sex conversation. The curse yeah. has been placed. And I was like, okay, it was very like it very much like, and she regrets now, and she obviously she's like, you know, I wish I'd been more open. But 
you know, it, she didn't she didn't have the language to talk about. She didn't know, like, it wasn't... She hadn't grown up talking about sex with her mum. She didn't think it was You're appropriate. to protect you, for sure. Yeah, and I think... I don't know if it was a protection. I think it was more just, like, it wasn't... Like, she didn't feel comfortable talking about sex. I mean, God, now, like, my parents are both journalists and they sit and they're brilliant editors and any article I've written, like, my book proposal, they've read everything and they're, like, completely horrified not horrified but they're <laughs> they're really scarred by having to read my um yeah everything I write about sex mm. but yeah my mum had never really spoken about me and I think then it wasn't something that was brought up in our household I remember once having a love bite on my neck and I was probably like 12 or 13 and my mum was like what is that on your neck and I was like I walked into a door <laughs> she was like <laughs> that had teeth <laughs> she was like but she just didn't say anything more I just it just wasn't something we ever ever mm. ever spoke about and they weren't comfortable talking about it and it's really funny now I'm like 31 and now I talk really openly like my sister like too openly to my parents about everything to do with like sex relationships dating. are they doing this yeah I like call my dad being like I went on this date and this happened this happened or like this guy's like a dick pic I'm like oh this stuff and my dad's like Emma why are you why are you telling me this but I also think they kind of, they love it in the way that they, I think it keeps them young. They're like, you know, we, they, I confide in them in, in everything. And I think also the nature of my work now, they're like, oh, fine. It is nice. And I think even to them, it's in a way liberating because again, yeah. you are showing them an example and you are giving them permission to maybe reconsider a little bit how totally. they view sex. So totally. good work. And I think, it's, <laughs> I think, thank you. I think that my mom has changed her. And I think it's interesting like looking back on it she does now say you know I, I you know I didn't she says like, I didn't know how to talk to you about this I didn't know how to approach this topic I didn't think it is something that a mum should talk to her daughter about and I don't and I don't blame her for that at all I mean she I think we all do the best we can with the tools yeah. we have yeah. and the knowledge that we have in front of us I've really struggled with eating disorder um stuff in my past and I know that it's something that like loads of women do struggle with and I've talked about this with my sister and said to her I um this the cycle has to end with me. Like, my mum had stuff with, you know, a weird relationship to food. I'm sure that, like, it was very... Generations before that, I think, you know, obviously very kind of strict in terms of their relationship to food. And I think it's really exciting to think that you get to parent differently mm. if and when you become a parent, whatever parenthood looks like you to you, whether I adopt, whether I have children. Actually, whether I, I feel like I take on a kind of mothering role to mm. my friends' kids, whatever that ro- that relationship looks like, I can't wait to be able to foster those conversations which have been so important to me in adulthood to be able to give them to kids, yeah. like you know to children growing up so amazing amazing legacy that yeah, you're exactly. going to be able to give forth exactly. so what made you go to sex therapy in the first place well I wasn't able to orgasm in partner sex had bad relationship sex and my I was at a dinner party one evening and I really didn't think my relationship sex was a problem like I didn't really my you don't friends, know what you don't know. Exactly. And my friends all talked about sex. Well, we talked about sex kind of openly in the sense that people were like, oh, I'm shagging this guy, shagging this guy. But I could never understand how people were so insouciant about their sexual exploits and seemingly so anxiety-free. And I was there, like, so in my head about it. Like, if I had went on a date with someone and then we went to have sex, I'd be so anxious about sex. I'd feel so worried was I doing it right? Was I, you know, I was really, really, you know, yeah, I felt this kind of anxiety weigh really heavy on me around sex, but I just didn't really think it was like a problem. And then I went to this dinner party and I was talking to these two women who were um, sat next to me. And for some reason we started talking about sex relationships and I relayed that I just wasn't a very sexual person, could have an orgasm, blah, blah, blah. And one of the girls, it turns out both of the women actually were seeing, um, had seen a sex therapist called Alex based in Australia. And they'd become evangelicals for the sex therapy cause. And they were telling me, like, they were like, you know, you can fix this issue that you have right now. This is something you really can address. And gave me her number and they were like, please, like, get in touch with this sex therapist. She's incredible and she can really help you. And... I didn't really feel like I had anything to lose. I was like, sure, like, I guess, yeah, like, why not try? And at the time I was writing, as I said, I was kind of founding editor at this um, amazing women's network media platform called The Stack, run by a very good friend of mine, Charmaine Reed. And she said to me at the time, you should write this as a column, Conversations with My Sex Therapist. It'd be really interesting, great copy. Great. I love a business incentive. That's like the kind of primary way of get, getting me to do anything is make it about work. And I'm in. So started sex therapy really to 
do this column and because I thought fuck mm. it like I might as well try I've got nothing to lose like my sex life isn't gonna get worse <laughs> um and luckily I think I've struggled with therapy before as I said I had quite a bad eating disorder growing up from age like 12 but I've never found a therapist I've liked I find therapy to me personally like quite unhelpful I think you get it can be it can be amazing for some people for me personally it just we would go over like relationship with parents stuff from the past I was just like I get this I've now what I, I'm like yeah what next like I under I've like therapized myself like I've read Freud I've read Lacan like come on like let's you're more forward. of a coach person rather than a therapist exactly. person but like what I loved about sex therapy was that you have a very clear well at least I had a very clear metric for success I couldn't orgasm in partner sex when I started sex therapy and our way of measuring the like improvement I'd made with regards to my relationship to sex so with regards to sex therapy was could I orgasm in partner sex and within six months I could and but I think more than that it was also my therapist was, sorry to interject what was the thing that helped you most um I think it was a few things I think first of all my sex therapist was very theoretical in the sense that she was really widely read and she drew on feminist theory she drew on psychoanalytic theory so her academic credentials made me feel like cool I trust you because that's what it always found frustrating is I found therapy boring whereas with her I really enjoyed our conversations and they really broadened my mind with regards to how I saw sex and where I saw it as how it p relates to gender equality issues my own relationship to my body to feminism etc and I think a huge component with and this is a long-winded way of answering a question but I will answer it now I think a couple things that were happening with regards to why I can orgasm I had what's called situational anorgasmia, which is basically where you can't orgasm in certain situations. So I could orgasm alone, like if I masturbated, but not in like partnered sex. And it's really common. It affects between 30 to 40% of women, and I think 20% of men, but I need to check that stat, um, at some point in their lives. And it's often, not for everyone, but most of the time it's psychosomatic. So it's in your head and it's an anxiety loop that basically happens. So you are in a sexual situation, you're not able to orgasm, you get really anxious about it. It's a point of concern. Next time you have sex, same thing happens. And then you kind of just build this like um, neuro pathway in your head that associates having sex with this anxiety mm. and not being able to orgasm and it becomes like self-perpetuating. And that really is what had happened to me. I didn't really because sex wasn't something I particularly enjoyed, it was, I didn't really masturbate, I didn't really like explore my body, I didn't really know what I liked. I remember someone asking me when I was probably like 26, um, and we were sleeping together and he was like, what do you like, what do you want me to do? And I was like, <laughs> in my head, I was like, I don't know. <laughs> like, I have no idea. And no one had ever asked me that before. And so I think there was, I didn't know what I liked. I hadn't felt comfortable talking about sex and I had this anxiety around sex. So I think, therapy was sex therapy was so effective because I was first and foremost breaking down the shame I felt around sex just by virtue of showing up each week and talking about sex very openly talking about my sexual experiences so that removed the kind of the shame piece um then it was my sex therapist saying to me you know you need to reconnect to your body you've had you know eating sort of fears I had I was quite badly bulimic you need to begin to associate your body with pleasure not just pain mm. not just punishment so she set me tasks I had to do a, like keep a pleasure journal and um write down like five things every day that gave my body like allow me to feel certain bits of pleasure um put a big focus on masturbation so it's all about kind of reconnecting to my body in a way that would allow me to see it as something I could experience pleasure from and not just be constantly punishing it and wanting it to be mm. thinner so I think over time it was an amalgamation of those things of breaking down the shame around sex and, and then like recalibrating my relationship to my body which for so long had been so bad wow <laughs> I hope people are taking notes because these are all valid, valid um, points that you've made. And especially, I think, the fact of seeking help mm. and that you don't have to settle. You don't have to accept that to be the normality, which for many people it is, for many women especially. Yeah, totally. They don't enjoy and they don't care about having sex because they're like, well, why Why would I even bother? It's like I'm not orgasming There anyway. was a really interesting piece of research that was done um, a little while ago that showed that... Um, from when asked about what good sex looks like men the majority of men said that for them good sex was orgasming and for women the majority of women said good sex is not experiencing pain and I think that really highlights 
a key issue with regards to how we are brought up thinking and talking about sex is that I think that the way sex, sex education is just so bad and the way we talk about sex is just really like, again, quite pitiful. And I think that what that does is not having proper sex education. Like my sex education in school was really bad. My parents didn't want to talk about sex at home and I totally respect and understand that. But it just meant that I did no like proper foundation Mm -hmm. of knowledge and understanding about sex that was set at a young age that then would allow me to distinguish as I got older good versus bad information when it came to sex. Instead, my relationship to sex, my sex education was formed through what my friend told me, what I maybe saw in porn, what a first experience with a guy might have looked like, first experience with a girl felt like, like all those things were an occasional magazine. Exactly. Oh my God, Ms. Magazine, like how to make your man come and like (laughs) 10 ways to a blowjob. How to keep a boyfriend. Exactly. All this like really piecemeal bitty information formed the foundation of my relationship to sex. And I, without that proper good sex education, I had no filtering system, like what is good, what is bad. And so I found myself, and it was interesting in sex therapy, I was, well, I did it at like 28. I was like, I'm in my late twenties and only now I'm standing back and being like, okay, what are the, what are the, what was the idea of sex I grew up with? How did I think sex was meant to be? How did I like, what did I think sex was gonna feel and look like? What were my expectations around sex? And where did that come from? Where did the shame come from? And suddenly I had to like unpack and unpick all the ideas I'd had about sex and completely rebuild that relationship to sex kind of from ground zero. And that was, I mean, it's a really amazing process to go through, but I think it's just such a shame that we don't get given the opportunity to like to build a really strong, helpful toolbox for sex, for like the language around sex, for our relationship to sex. And I think that that is, does us all such a disservice because I think what it does, and I think especially, sorry, with sex, with the kind of how bad sex education is. I mean, my sex education was don't get an STI and don't get pregnant. So it was very like fear-based and minimal. There was no focus on pleasure. And what that does is that just sets such a low bar Mm. with regards to what to expect from sex. So when I first had penetrative sex, it was like really uncomfortable, but I didn't think, I mean, that was what sex was meant. If you don't know, you don't know. Exactly. And the pleasure piece hadn't been central. And with that, then I hadn't like sought to understand what my, what my body liked, what felt good, what didn't, because just pleasure wasn't a, like something that I'd really focused on. So I think that it's just so key for us all to, I mean, I wish we'd all just have a much better sex education so that we can really learn to prioritize pleasure in our lives more broadly, but in our sex lives specifically. But I think without that, it's really hard, yeah, to do that. Thank you for touching up on this. And I will have a few questions from the audience that they have for you. And because it just perfectly aligns, I will ask one of them now. So one of them, one of the ladies, she's 23, she was asking, how do you start viewing sex differently and start viewing it as something you do for yourself and not for your man? So that's mm, a great the, the, the epitome of what you just said. Yeah reformulating what sex is really about and what it should be about what are the pointers that you should be looking out for aka pleasure is is a fundamental shift in Mm. in what we've been brought up to Mm. think up until now Mm. i think i mean it's a great question i think it's your relationship to sex is about so much more than just fucking it's about your relationship to your body and your relationship to yourself And I think building that relationship and exploring your relationship to your body is the kind of first most important step to creating a, I guess to kind of creating a sex life outside of the context of partnership. Mm. So for me, when I was doing sex therapy, it was very much about beginning to masturbate, which I hadn't really done before that much. And, and really like be intentional with it, like put aside time to explore my body, to figure out what felt good and what didn't for me. And sex, for me, it always been very performative to your point to the, um, the woman who asked us, it had been something that I felt I did for somebody else's pleasure. I was there as a kind of prop, a tool, and I was giving the you know, performance of my lifetime to 
to make someone else feel pleasure, to make someone else come. And I think sex can still pe- be performative in a fun way. Like I think it is quite fun for sex to be playful and performative and a bit silly. I and mean, then you do take on a kind of different role sometimes in sex and whether that's actually role play or just you actually kind of experimenting a bit with feeling like this like super hot sassy boss bitch lady I don't know whatever it may be I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing but I think it's really important to be able to build that connection with your sexuality and with your body in a context in which it's not performative so it's not for someone else Mm. and I think that if when you do that through self-pleasure through yeah exploring your body I think it also it just allows you to have that connection to yourself connection to your sexuality that's not dependent on anybody else Mm. and I think that then it means when you do have sex with somebody else when you do have you know one night stand sex with your partner whatever it may be you you know what feels good and you know what you like how you want someone to touch you or you know what you'd be maybe keen to explore but you're not always delegating responsibility to somebody else to show you what you like and to give you like you're not dependent fully on another person to be there totally to be there but also I think sometimes when people ask me like oh no if that guy who asked me when I was uh, like 26 you know what do you like and I think I didn't know and I didn't know what to how to answer because I I just had you know no real experience in like self-pleasure or anything and because of that in a way I realized I was kind of delegating responsibility to my sexual partners to show me what would feel good sexually, which is kind of unfair. Mm. Like Florence Bach, who runs this brilliant sex platform, Come Curious, said on the sex talk stage a little while ago, your pleasure is your responsibility, which I think is really true. Because I think after, especially when I was doing sex therapy, I felt a bit resentful of previous sexual partners. I was like, you know, we have an orgasm gap, orgasm gap disparity between the rate at which men versus women orgasm. Men orgasm a lot more than women in partnered heteronormative sex. I was like, you know, it's men's, you know, the men I'm sleeping with, it's like, it's their fault. Like they prioritize their pleasure over mine. And then over time, like I had to kind of take some responsibility. Like mm. the people I'm sleeping with, partners, whoever, it's not their job to know what feels good for me and to tell me like I really need to I need to advocate for my own pleasure but the only way to do that is if I actually know what I want and I so I think that's true in all aspects of your life and I wrote a piece about this once that uh, confidence in the bedroom builds confidence in the boardroom and I really think this is true if you can advocate for yourself in the most intimate vulnerable environment that is sex I think that builds your overall confidence to then in other aspects of your life to assert what it is you want and what it is you need. So from bedroom to boardroom, that confidence I think is, yeah, it's key. If not for anything else, for that (laughs) success in the business world, we need to step up. Very interesting. I mean, I've had quite a few uh, podcast guests recently and we've spoken about sexuality, we've spoken about relationships, we've spoken about intimacy and pleasure. And more and more, it just seems to be emerging for me as a whole different category of your self-development in a way. Mm. So how is my physical health? How am I taking care of it? How's my mental health? How's my emotional well-being? How is my sexuality? Mm. So that is forming to be for me in my mind, a whole different category that one should take care of. Mm. I think I, I I agree with that entirely and I think I because I felt like I really wasn't sexual I like cut off that side of myself for a long time and I didn't think that mattered mm. but something Billy Quinlan said to me once in an interview and she runs a sexual wellness platform called Furley it's like audio erotica and she said that our sexuality is such a key component of our, sorry, our sexual wellness is such a key component of our overall health and well-being. And we, neg- when we neglect that one facet of ourselves, we actually it has a detrimental impact on our whole self. Yeah. And I think this is definitely true. And for for me personally, I felt that my we, my dysfunctional relationship to sex, alongside my eating disorder, were like these two these like twin pillars of shame. They were like my dirty little secrets Mm. that I didn't want anyone to know about, that I didn't really talk about. They were these things that happened behind closed doors. And it was like this kind of 
shadow side of, of myself. And it was, I functioned very, very well with those two things behind, but they were a huge burden on my like life and not, not in a kind of woe be me way, but they had- They were holding really, you back. They, they chipped away at my confidence massively because there's such a point, points of shame. And I mean, the eating disorder, like, as anyone who has an eating disorder or has experienced one knows, like it really does take a lot of headspace to manage an eating disorder at all mm. times because you constantly have a voice in your head telling you not to eat, to be at the gym for hours, to be sick if you eat and all this, it, you know, it's very all consuming. In the same way, dating when you're really scared of sex, it really holds you back because you're so scared of the intimate component of the relationships that you have with people. And it's a massive blocker to intimacy. And then even when you are being intimate with someone, if you're really scared, you're holding back yeah. and also you're holding back and then you're just being performative. It does, it definitely does kind of um, hinder intimacy and closeness with people. And so I think that it, I can see now with the benefit of hindsight, I've gone through sex therapy. What I couldn't see then was that these two things, which was fundamentally wrapped up in my relationship to my body as it pertained to eating disorder, sex, had a massive impact on the rest of my life that I wasn't necessarily able to see on my confidence, how I showed up at work, my insecurities, etc. And so I think when you can tackle whatever is holding you back, whatever is hindering you in the privacy of your, like in the day-to-day -day of your private life. Mm. So what, how you, like the things that are eating away at you when you're sitting at home alone, when you are in your bed at night alone, if you can tackle the things that are plaguing you there and in those moments, then I think that can have such a big impact on how you then show up in the rest of your life. 100%, I, I couldn't agree more. It's like carrying these huge stones on your shoulders that are invisible at all times. And once you deal with them and you can just finally drop them off your shoulders how much taller will you stand and how much faster will you walk and how much further will you go so it makes a lot of sense speaking of closed doors behind closed doors so you're obviously on camera a lot you speak to a lot of people there's a lot of content that you're putting out how are you when all the cameras turn off and you're off the stage what are exactly the same exactly the same <laughs> yeah. okay okay yeah. i needed to know <laughs> i exactly the same and i think that's probably yeah, like genuinely. That's so. why it's easy. Yeah, because I really love talking. Evidently, I talk way too much. But I talk <laughs> loads and I'm really curious. And I'm really curious about um, other people. I mean, I also feel kind of funny saying I'm really curious and literally I'm sitting here talking about myself <laughs> for like an hour in like the most uncurious way of being. I mean, for once, the, the roles are reversed. Exactly. Come on. And I actually, um, yeah, I always find like the relinquishing of control when I'm not the interviewer quite weird but you're doing great I'm really thank you I'm yeah I'm really curious and I love knowing how I love finding out how other people live their lives and what motivates people and what everything I just love asking questions I just get the why 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 thing and particularly when you're talking about sex and relationships it, because the remit of the discussions we have at sex talks it, immediately it puts you into pretty intimate conversation and I love that and I find that with even people I meet well a lot of people I meet outside of sex talks I'll like I remember being in Lisbon and I went I joined this running club I was there for like a week and I was like I need to join run, I need to like get some you know people to exercise with me so I joined this running club and I went running with this guy and he was like a crypto guy classic, classic. and he but immediately he started telling me about his business da, da, da. and then he asked me like what do you do and as soon as I say I run a business called sex talks Obviously, it just it moves the conversation into a very intimate um, dynamic very quickly because why did you set up sex talks? And the, the story is really personal and it's about sex, it's about eating so And I'm happy to tell it. It's also the, the truth of the why of the company. But it immediately propels that conversation in direction that then suddenly there is an... I think because I'm forced to be really vulnerable mm. really quickly with someone, just telling them the story of, of sex talks. People reciprocate. People reciprocate. And suddenly this person's telling me about their relationship to their parents, their relationship to sex growing up, how that reflected their parents' relationship dynamic. Mm. And suddenly we're having such an intimate, interesting conversation while running, while running along the, <laughs> the, the sea nice. But I love that. And I think 
that I feel it feels like such a privilege getting to do that through sex talks getting to have these conversations with people that I think just wouldn't I really could never imagine doing when I was working in the newsroom like imagine asking people such personal questions about like sex and relationships and you know their marriage or like their Not ideas in the protocol. about monogamy exactly mm. so yeah I think exactly the same <laughs> sensational well I mean I can testify to that as much as I know you off camera so that's true but I just wanted to check so out of all these people that you've spoken to, yeah. obviously the experts of their industries, incredible geniuses, can you tell me some of the things that have struck you most and have stayed with you most? Oh, great question. Um, well, first and foremost, Florence Bark, the Your Pleasure is Your Responsibility was like a little wake up call. It was like she gave me a little shake and I was like, yeah, you are so right. Um, sex therapist Kate Moyle, who is, has become a friend um, through doing sex talks, I think is brilliant. And she talks a lot about the shoulds that we carry with us into sex. So I should feel like it, sex should be like this. I should be wet enough. I should, 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 should. Mm-hmm. And I think in all aspects of our lives, we often carry a lot of shoulds, which really articulate the expectations that have often been put on us from external places around how things should be. that aren't necessarily particularly helpful. And particularly in the context of sex, all these shoulds, again, are reflective of this amalgamation of probably like, misshapen knowledge that we've accumulated around sex and our sexuality and often doesn't really reflect what we want or who we are and so I think she's banned should from her therapy room so she's like well once you like get rid of the shoulds that people feel you begin to have much better relationship to sex and that's been really helpful to me about thinking about what are the ideas around sex that I've inherited that I've picked up from external sources versus what I actually think and Mm. want from it so that's definitely always stuck with me I've just interviewed Paul Brunson um, for sex talks this week, two days ago, he is the world's number one matchmaker, and he's currently a co-host on Married at First Sight, the um, the Channel Four show that is yeah currently on TV. He is the one of the most incredible thinkers I've interviewed. No least, not least because he just reels off data, books, information in a way that is just phenomenal. But he approaches the topic of relationships and love. And then in turn, sex, with a depth and a nuance I think we don't often see in this area. Very data-driven. He loves, he kept on saying, he's like, I love a longitudinal study. But it, what I loved about the conversation with him is that it, he lends through that very data-driven, very science-backed approach to talking about relationships, he lends a real he gives this topic area a gravitas that sometimes I think we don't Mm. offer it because you know there's so many articles of like you know 10 ways to give your guy a blow job or like you know three hot tips for um making a relationship better I mean all that stuff is fine but it's all very quippy and it's all like you know red flag green flag like you know is your partner a narcissist um (laughs) Dropping these like deep psychology, like yeah. psychology terms without much context or understanding of what they actually mean. Um, whereas Paul approaches this and yeah, as I said, very, very data driven. And he talks a lot about uh, there is a science to relationships and there is a like science. Yeah, it's right. And so I mean, just this, he preaches. I mean, everything he said um, was so informative and and, and, you know, for example, when it comes to like dating, so one thing that people continually, um, or he's seen people really kind of trip up on is not redefining really what they actually want, define their boundaries and what their yeah. expectations are early on. And I think that can often come from a scarcity mindset. You're like, oh, I'm just like so grateful to be here because you think you're so fit or whatever. Yeah. And you're not really necessarily being upfront about what you actually want and also have you defined what you want. Um, but yeah, that conversation really stuck with me because... I also feel that I'm single and dating and obviously talking about dating a lot. And I think it's quite easy to become quite cynical, especially mm-hmm. in a digital dating era in which dating can be a lot. And I have had especially my- Especially in London. Oh my God. <laughs> I've had my fair share of like quite horrific dates. Really? Of like, yeah. But as my friend Alia says, do it for the story. Um, no, do it for the plot. But I think it's easy to become a little bit hardened to because of those experiences and to lose your capacity for vulnerability in dating because you feel like you need to be hard to weather the constant storm that is modern day dating. Mm. And I really noticed myself, even the way I spoke about dating and relationships, being very pessimistic and being very like, you know, 
it's all monogamy is a stitch up anyway. I don't want to get married. It's a patriarchal institution. You know, all men are trash. All these sort of like very generalizing statements. I didn't really believe, and they were just reflective of me of feeling hurt. Yeah, and that's what it came down to. It was my feeling hurt, and my my like best defense mechanism was to be like write it all off anyway. And you know, and a lot about sex talks is also exactly and it's also challenging the like normative ideas we have around relationships like you must get married you must you know very heteronormative like you must date a man it's very good to unpack all those of those things but it's not helpful to dismiss them outright just because you feel hurt in dating so talking to Paul I felt I came away from our discussion feeling really inspired and hopeful and excited about love Mm -hmm. in all its manifestations and because I feel like he kind of gives you these tools in relationships through his like relationship science that make you feel like you have agency in dating again, where maybe I felt like I'd lost with my agency because I was a bit like, I felt maybe for a bit like a little bit passive, like, mm. oh, these like shit dates and people keep happening. Okay, can you give me one? It's a really long story. I, long story short, I went to Lisbon. Cabin in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. I okay, did. Actually, okay. <laughs> wow. I did. I really did. I went to earlier this year. I'd met someone very briefly at a bar in September, and we. I then like came back to London. I we were just texting and calling loads. Met at an intellectual level for sure, and I ended up going to Lisbon because I was going on holiday, but also wanted to see him. And he was like, "Well, let's go away for a weekend away. I'll book everything. It'd be really nice to get out of the city." And I was like. Great. Great. First date, let's go to the middle of nowhere. Why not? So he booked this bungalow in the middle of nowhere. We had this like three day road trip that he planned. And it was a disaster. Like there was from day, from like the first day we spent together, he just was very, very distant and would like quite physically like stand away from me in a way that was just, but, but didn't say anything. And we, it was quite a weird dynamic. I didn't really know like what, to, I should have said something and I didn't, I felt quite nervous about it. Anyway, on the third day, um, when this was the last day, it was the Sunday, we were in this bungalow in the middle of this like Lisbon countryside woods. And he was like, we should, I don't know how, whether I should say this, we should take acid and go for a walk. And I'd never taken, I like don't take drugs and, I mean, partial to hallucinogenic, but anyway, I was like, fuck it, fine, sure. So we take acid and we went for this walk and the first four hours were beautiful. And um, he, you know, we were, I was like, all I could say was, wow, this is wild. Like, this is so Mm -hmm. amazing. Um, And we were being quite close and tactile. And I was like, we've broken through, like, oh my God. And then we went back to the bungalow and we were kissing and he just like pulled away and was, I was like, ah, I need to tell you how I feel. I was like, you know what? We're on acid. You really don't. (laughs) He was like, no, I really do. And I was like, you don't, you don't. And at this point I had like a bun on the top of my head. I was in a full tracksuit wearing sunglasses, like really out of it. And he was like, I think you're, you're, you're great. You know, we, I think you're super smart but you're just not attractive and just physically you're not attractive and I'm just not Did attracted he say, to you. You're not attractive yeah. instead of saying I'm not attracted to you? He yeah, actually said it. he was, yeah, he was like very explicit. And he, yeah, and I was, I was like, okay. And he was like, yeah, he just, I feel so bad for you. Like I brought you all the way here. And I just, you know, I knew from the moment that you arrived. And I was like, this is so crushing. He's like, I knew from the moment you arrived that this was a mistake. I just feel so bad for you because you obviously really want to have sex with me and I just don't want to have sex with you. And I was like, the context of this <laughs> setup is that, like, you know, you put this whole weekend away. Obviously, I want to have sex with you because, like, what else are we going to do together? Okay, Wait, it was the worst date. Real talk, though. In that situation, if you were in reverse roles, what should he have said? Oh, good question. Um, I would really, really have appreciated it if when we were driving to the bungalow, um, because we'd spent a night in Sintra, if he had just said on the way, Emma, can I just talk to you? But yeah, yeah, what's up? Um, Sober, in a car, in an environment where we're not like facing each other and just said, I am really hung up my ex-girlfriend and I think being with you now in this like quite intense environment, it's just bringing up a lot of feelings. Could we do this as friends? And it would have been awkward and it would have been uncomfortable for a bit, but at least I would have known. And then I would have been able to 
manage my feelings and my actions in accordance to mm. that knowledge. Yeah. Because as it was, leading up to that last day, on really irresponsible to do that on acid as well. Like from a like health and safety yeah, yeah, perspective, yeah, yeah. really, really irresponsible. Nice. I realized I'm like, great. I've got very good mental health now because I was fine. But I really really irresponsible if it had been like five years ago and I was in my mid like I would have that I you know that's just not okay you, probably I just think irresponsible on you should never do have that sort of conversation in in on on hallucinogenic if you just said that yeah of course my brute is bru- my ego would have been bruised but you're then giving me the information that I can decide what to do with that. Instead, I felt like passive. Equally, if I could go back, probably would have said something myself on the first day, being like, I can sense there's something off. Yeah. Could you tell me what's up? So on both our parts, there was a communication breakdown. Um, and maybe he should have also said it before we drove two and a half hours outside Lisbon, because if he'd been re- getting it from the moment we left, like we could have avoided the whole thing. Yeah. That being said, it was a shit first aid. <laughs> and I learned a lot from it. And actually... I, on the sun, on the Monday when I woke up the next day and obviously felt like, oh, like that's really crushing. Obviously you don't find everyone attractive and that's fine, but it was really that the environment and, w- and the way he said it was just really, it crushes yeah. you. And it brought up a lot of stuff that I think I'd addressed in sex therapy of like not feeling like sexual and there being something wrong with me and me being somehow like yeah me being like really flawed and somehow like not yeah it just it brought up a lot of that which I found hard but then I was like right no I'm not gonna fall down this hole I'm not gonna like make this about me this is a you know yeah this is a him thing this is a it is. He's just into it. but in my head I was like right this can never happen again mm. by which I meant I never want to be trapped in a bungalow, <laughs> in the countryside, <laughs> on a first date, without being able to get away on my own. At that time, I could not drive. Okay. I didn't have a driver's license, so he had driven me there. So the next day, he had driven me back to Lisbon. I then came home, and I was like, I'm getting a driver's license, because I need to know that I can escape <laughs> if this ever happens again. Do you now have a driver's license? Yes. Pass first time. Nice. Within three months. This is what motivation does to you. Exactly. I'm very embarrassed to admit I've been trying to get one of this for like two years. I need that sort of motivation. Honestly, I had been learning to drive since I was 17, on and off, just not committing to it. And when I was in that bungalow in Lisbon, I was just like, hashtag never again. Hashtag I'm, thank you for helping me get my license honestly, right now. and now I can drive. And I feel, and that, and thank that you, Mr. first Man. <laughs> time I went to Greece over the summer and I rented a car and I drove my friend around and I was like, yes, motherfucking yes. I have this, this freedom felt so tasted so much sweeter because of the context in which that motivation had been born so I'm actually very grateful for it and I have no no hard feelings towards him I mean it's like I don't think it was malicious or bad yeah and that's what I also think with all of these things any bad date any situation like that it's really easy to be to make it a personal thing to of course, I came back, told my friends, and I was like, hey, he's a dick. He's such a... <laughs> Girl power team. Thing. Exactly. And obviously, that's what I wanted to hear. Like, obviously, all my friends be like, yeah, dickhead. But fundamentally, like, again, I think most people aren't doing... Aren't, like, behaving out of malice. Mm. Aren't trying to fuck you over. Some people definitely are. But majority of the time, it is just poor communication. Mm. And that's what it often comes down to. And, yeah, it was a bit shit. Yeah, it bruised my ego. But, like you're fine. And I think that's what I interviewed a love coach, Vicky Pavett, who's brilliant the other day, not the other day, months ago, but she, I asked her, I was like, how are you meant to stay open and vulnerable to love and relationships, but also harden yourself enough to weather (laughs) these knockdowns and the rejection that the lots of rejection that invariably comes with um, with dating and particularly in a digital era in which you're meeting so many different people and she was like ultimately Emma exposure therapy you just got to keep on dating and you need to just you need to fall down and get up faster because the longer you spend down the more you internalize the things that happened on the mm. bad date with that rejection overanalyze and, over over-analyze, and it's not helpful and I always say to my sister with general like life things and uh, whatever she's coming through with is it ain't that deep like don't deep the small things like 
pick your battles of what to really get upset yeah. and you know anguished about most of the time like rejection is sore it hurts but you live like you're fine you'll move on and actually you learn a ton from it you get a driver's license maybe yeah excellent the guy literally gave you freedom exactly Thank you. exactly so i think i never regret any of the like bad dates or the, the horrible rejections or the mean words like you don't you know they don't kill you so. it's really about how you can turn around the situations that seem the worst yeah. into the best outcomes for you yeah. that aha uh-huh. and communication really is a key and as i said looking back like go, what i learned from what i took away from that apart from driver's license is i could tell something was off of course i could from the moment we set off there was a distance it was weird because i didn't he was quite a like broody <laughs> like dark horse vibe so i wasn't sure if that was kind of his <laughs> thing so that was like that's slightly through me not knowing the person at all and having like very little context with them it does make things a bit trickier but obviously you said you have a sense of someone's vibe and and like their energy and i just wish i'd had the confidence to say something but i think i was like scared of i'm all i think i used to be scared of calling into existence the thing i feared was already there that's a real one and it's not if you just address uh, address the elephant in the room address the silence address whatever you're feeling that's weird because you're not going to make it mm. a thing if it's not already there but usually your instincts are that's a real accurate. one that's a real one so in everything that you do i see that there's this purpose infused uh, feeling that I that I sense especially what you're doing right now versus what you said that your day-to-day was when you're working in news so what would you say if you can describe it is your purpose wow I don't think I've ever been asked my purpose before I think my purpose in life and work is to make people feel less alone in whatever that it is that they're going through and by that I mean I really think that oftentimes, so seldom we actually learn with whatever we're battling internally. Usually it's just the shame piece that keeps us not talking about it and then feeling very alone in that. And I think that there is so much power in conversation and in sharing our experiences. And I think that I really love being able to create a space and to facilitate conversations that bring into the fore things that can obviously that can often be points of shame um, for people in their day to day and to show them that like it's okay you're not alone we're all going through this and it's okay to talk about this sort of stuff and I think that's always been something and I think I feel that on like a personal day-to-day basis like if someone tells me something that whatever they're going through my like all my instinct just always I just want to make people feel like not embarrassed and not alone and not worried about whatever it is that they are really struggling with at that point in time and like hold me like no 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 no, no. it's okay it's okay like I've got you like I've gone through that like don't worry like I immediately want to make someone feel really comfortable because I I I so know that feeling of feeling broken or feeling alone, feeling ashamed of who you are, inadequate, and feeling like, yeah, and like kind of trying to hide all that. Like I really know that so well. And it pains me to see anyone else experiencing that. And so I think through the power of conversation and taboo busting conversation, first and foremost, I think I am able to yeah, bring these sorts of conversations into the fore and hopefully make, yeah, fewer people feel, to help more people feel less alone in what they're going through. I love that. And the fact that you hadn't, I hadn't told you that I'm going to ask you this and you were able to formulate it that beautifully just tells a story that you really are, are living it. Hopefully. So I guess I'd like to know the feeling that you have inside when you compare your now to the past and how that internal feeling has changed for you now that you are living with a purpose? I think I always was. So I don't think, I think um, I always, I did study politics. I did masters in psychoanalysis and worked at think tank and all that stuff. I always wanted to do positive social good. That was always my thing that motivated me from, and that's why I really liked politics. Like politics is literally like the stuff. I mean, politics is, everything everywhere it's not just policy which I think often there is a 
confusion there that we just think politics is what politicians are doing in Westminster and that's not true so many things are political but I was always motivated by how do I make a positive impact on the world and what does that look like I was always interested in in the gender equality piece how do we create a more equitable world in which men and women coexist when men women non-binary people coexist happily healthily we're still a long way off but Um, But I think early on in my career, I didn't know, I was so focused on the positive social good point, I didn't think about what I actually wanted to spend my time doing. Mm. So I went into the think tank, first of all, and then I went, I also, in between all this, worked in a few charities. Um, And I didn't enjoy the day-to-day at all. I found it really boring sitting in a back room, like, just tapping away, doing research. And because, but I was like, this is positive good. I worked for for companies that were like it was doing good and I would always volunteer and stuff around that um and then working in the newsroom it felt again I think how we see the world shapes how we act in it yeah the stories that we are exposed to day to day shape how we behave day to day the stories we tell ourselves about who we are and how we you know affect how we then show up in the world so I think that media and storytelling is really important and I would like to think I always brought that mentality to my work and I was an interviews producer for years and I really I spent a lot of time like researching like who would be the best voices for us to have Mm. on this conversation who I think will actually deepen people's understanding in a positive way of this discussion we're having working in 24-hour news does not necessarily lend itself to a lot of nuance and depth and a lot of the time there was also just the demands of time and fast turnaround but I think what I've done with this current platform where I feel really um, proud and excited with regards to where I am now is that I have figured out what I really love doing aka I love interviewing people I love building something I love building my own company I love building my own brand I love building a community I love that ownership and that freedom so I love the the, the, the day-to-day of what I do and the research I get to do the people I get to speak to I really enjoy that and it also allows me to being aligned with my purpose of helping people feel less alone in what they're going through and also that pos- that for me that's positive social impact so I've kind of been able to like mm. create now the thing that allows me to do all of those things where previously I felt like I was always just just doing the one I was either in the charity but not liking the day-to-day of it but it was ticking that box of this is so- this is good or it was like being you know in the newsroom and trying to get that in but really being like this is not necessarily I know that we're not having a overall particularly positive impact socially um so I think my friend Rob said this to me the other day he was like I think if you're someone that that an effective person will be able to affect positive change wherever they are whatever they're doing mm. and I just feel very grateful that I've now created something that allows me to enjoy this day-to-day and have positive social impact mm, I love that and the reason why I asked you that question is uh, in my coaching as well, I, I speak to a lot of people and they're not they're not really happy with where they are, but mm. there doesn't seem to be this clarity uh, mm. as to what is it that they should be doing. So before we started this interview, I shared with you what was my process and mm. it was kind of a very intentional sit down exercises that I had to go through with mm. myself in order to finally peel off those last, last layers to understand precisely what it is mm. that I have to do in my life so that it aligns as much as possible with who I am, what I like, what I, what is the change that I want to see in the world and ultimately uncover what is that purpose for me. So with your journey, it was also, I see these iterations of, of doing this thing and then each thing that you tried and you changed, it brought you closer to where you ultimately are right now. And so I guess my question is for anyone watching, I know what helped me, but for example, if you had to put in your own words this as close to a formula that you could for a person to help them step on this path to ultimately uncover what their purpose is or what that thing for them is what would you say could help I think first of all I think you need to just I think trial and error I think some people seem to know from day dot what they're put on this planet to do and that's amazing. That was definitely not me. And that's still, still not me. But I think that the thing I regret, people always like, I have no regrets. I'm like, I definitely do. I, <laughs> I regret all the time I spent feeling so worried and anxious about, what, about this question of like, what am I meant to be doing with my life? 
And I was doing really interesting, cool stuff, but I was just always in this spiral of like, what's the, what's the next thing? Is this enough? And not making the most of the situations I was in because I was so worried about the bigger picture. And it's easy now to make sense of the path that led me to here because now I can kind of make a cohesive narrative that everything fit together and is always leading to this point. But it didn't feel like that at all at the time. I don't really think it was like that either. Mm. You make sense, you, you know, you write the story, I think in the aftermath, and you make yeah. it all make sense afterwards. But that is the only thing I regret. I regret just being so worried about that bigger picture. And I think ultimately you, you need to focus. First of all, you need to just do. You're not gonna like everything Everything you do. You're not gonna like every job. You're you're just not, and that does, that's okay. They teach you, just like the bad dates, the bad jobs also teach you what you don't want. And I think the thing is just to keep, if you're like a creative person, like keep creating. If you wanna write, keep writing. If you wanna interview people, keep interviewing. And just find different ways of doing the thing that brings you joy. And if you don't know what brings you joy, try everything. Mm. Just keep trying. And maybe it will take you a long time to find the thing that finally clicks, but at least you'll find it. Because I think some people will get stuck in a job or career that doesn't bring them that joy. And maybe they don't want that. Maybe they want to earn money and their joy comes out of work. And that's that's fine too. But if you are some, someone that is really purpose-led and you want your work to bring you life satisfaction and you your life is really, if you define your life a lot by the work that you do, which... I think that's true for a lot of people. And I also think that is okay. I do think it's worth spending that time and to, to figure out what, the, what it is that you're really, really, really passionate about. And so I think obviously you need to pay bills, like get a job that hopefully <laughs> aligns with something you're interested in and it might not be perfect, but also see strategically how can I use this job, this role, this platform, this company, the networks I make here to like grow my network, grow my expertise, and then volunteer outside of that. Like I used to volunteer for tons of events. I've worked in events since I was 15, working in like wedding events and then volunteering at literary festivals. I volunteered at film festivals, volunteer, volunteered at the feminist um, like conference here in London. So I was always at events, which I didn't realize that events would become like the thing that I would work in really. But I guess like unconsciously, I loved the like live element of things. And you were drawn towards that. I was just drawn towards mm -hmm. it. So I just kept volunteering in my free time and I'd always get free tickets to things. I was broke as everyone who graduates is. So I was broke, I had no money to buy the tickets, but I would just volunteer so I'd get into those rooms and then met loads of people through that volunteering. So I think doing, I think, so I think, yeah, just keep, just keep putting yourselves in rooms where you get to speak to people who interest you so that even if you don't necessarily know exactly what you want right now, you're being inspired by big brains mm. and then just keep trying and don't, and again, ain't that deep, like just keep, yeah, just keep moving forward and trying and experimenting and read widely and you know Paul Brunson at the end of the talk the other day I no in the middle of the talk actually I asked we talked about like the politics politics of desire mm. and I asked whether you can reshape you can recalibrate um your desire like who you're drawn to mm -hmm. I think desire is innately political it's not just like it's innate to who we are like oh I just happen to fancy this person it's no like society paints a picture of what is attractive and yeah. what isn't etc and he was like the key to um the key to relationships is curiosity and ultimately you want a curious partner life with a curious partner is a much happier healthier more exciting life the key to meeting a curious partner is being curious yourself and how do you get curious you read widely you get your information from different sources, you speak to different people. And I kind of think that is a really great piece of advice that you can apply to any and all aspects of your life, is stay really curious and make sure that your diet of information is very varied. varied. I think that the way I consume news, for example, I read widely. If you read one publication, you're getting one worldview. If you read, read widely, follow different social media accounts, Get your information from different sources. Watch different also from types contrasting of films. ones that you don't agree. Exactly, and like I'm about to read a book now, which already is going about. Um, it's getting you triggered. <laughs> it is. It's kind of. It's just like oh, I'm like oh, I don't know if I agree with this, and I'm like, you know what? This is good. Don't always seek out information that reaffirms your worldview. Yeah. That's how bubbles are created. Exactly. So I think. So going back, to, I think that the the 
the nub of that piece of advice, which I think we can all apply to our life, our work, our purpose, our relationships, is stay super curious and feed that curiosity. And Malcolm Gladwell talks about curiosity as being something that you have to actively cultivate. You're not mm. just innately a curious person or not. I mean, I'm sure you know, we're predisposed to be um, somewhat more curious than others maybe, but foster it, like nurture your creativity, take yourself to the bookshop, go to the cinema, go to the theater, like listen to podcasts. There's so much free material now. Mm. So you don't have those cash on you right now. Listen to podcasts, they're free. There's so much you can do to nurture your, creati uh, your creativity and your curiosity. And I think ultimately, if you continue to do that, you will be, you will eventually find yourself on the right path. That we're to you. Absolutely. And I just want to add one thing that this is not uh, age restricted because it can sound sometimes totally. that we're talking about only no. younger people, At but I think a lot of, of yeah, I, I, a lot of people find themselves in maybe having worked somewhere for 20 years and then they're like, well, this is not what I wanted. Are you still alive is my question. If you are still alive, you still have time yeah. to pursue the thing you want to pursue. Exactly. I think we have a very um, damaging narrative that, well, I think culturally we put a premium on youthful success, that achieving things like Forbes 13 to 30, all these accolades we... Uh, use to reward success achieved young if you can achieve great success young amazing but there's no like f end point to your ability to do great work make create find your purpose like change what you want to do until you're gone when you're gone yes then you when you're dead you are you're no longer able to find your purpose and like <laughs> yeah sad, like your case is closed but until that point like I, it saddens me to when I hear friends say you know I'd, I'd love to do this but I've, I've left it too late I'm like how have you left it too late like you're still alive and kicking there's grannies jumping now. out of airplanes at 90 come on you have time exactly <laughs> exactly isn't that that Chinese proverb that said like it's about I'm gonna butcher it if I say it or something like the best day to so your field was yesterday. Yeah. But like today will do. <laughs> that was a terrible, <laughs> was a terrible, um, I really fucked that one. But, 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 do, but do it like, also those you spend your whole life regretting the things that you didn't do. And that's oh, such a Oh, hell waste. no. Yeah. That's the one yeah. thing I'm kind of not comfortable with. Yeah. And I always think if, if you're at a point now in your career, in your life, whatever it may be, that you feel that you aren't in the right place and you want to make a change, you don't know what that change looks like, but you also have like practical things to deal with you have rent to pay family to support whatever it may be again do the things on the side like make time exactly. do a course sign up to something like there's lots of ways of beginning to like um fuel a new stream of curiosity which then gives don't... energy to yes. even perform better at the current job yes. i think it's people when they accept this defeat and like it's over for me it's too late for me yeah. that's when the 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 eyelids yeah. shut and yeah. then the, the 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 whole body shuts down yeah. and then the depression comes in and then yeah. the and then you feel trapped in the yeah. situation that you've yeah. created like i just was thinking, just change things that's why i get annoyed actually when people complain 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 about the same thing which i find myself doing and i know it's, it's bad but like change it you're change not it. as much as we can, as much as within our control in our lives and i appreciate circumstances can be different for different people and they're things that some people can't change and i and i acknowledge that but like don't be a victim of your life like be yeah. the architect of it. And my friend Dior always says this to me, live a life by design, not default. Be intentional with what you want to do and how you do it. And yeah, and, and go Amen. out there and yeah. Do it. I'm being mindful of time because yes. I know you got to run. Yes. So I'll just ask you the two questions, two other mm -hmm. questions that we have from the audience. So how does having a retroverted uterus what? affect like having sex? Uh, I can't answer that, I'm afraid. Okay. okay. Only because I feel i would do that disservice i feel like that is someone that needs to be a, a medical point. professional needs to answer i that. was not hoping on that but yeah just in case Sorry. just in case you had think, a guest that literally spoke about that yeah no i feel like i wouldn't be able to do medical physiological justice to that question so i won't answer that okay and then the last one yes. is um does using sex toys impact your desire to have sex with the partner this is a question that comes up all the time at sex talks. I think people think that you will desensitize yourself by using a vibrator, for example. Mm. And it's hard to have a definitive answer because the answers I have received from sex therapists et cetera, are, are varied. And there are a lot of sex therapists who have told me that no, you will not desensitize yourself by using sex toys. Dr. Karen Gurney, whose book everyone should read, Mind the Gap, said that it's not so much a matter of 
desensitizing yourself is that you get used to a certain type of sexual stimulation that you then come to associate with orgasm. So for example, if you're using a vibrator every single night, you create the neural pathway that gets you used to achieving orgasm through this very specific type of clitoral stimulation. When it then comes to having sex with a partner, you're not repeating that same clitoral stimulation that a vibrator gives you. It's a different type of sex. And if you've got very used to that type of sex, it might then be harder to mm. achieve orgasm to feel that same level of sexual pleasure. So that's the kind of, the, that's where it's not so much a desensitization as you just kind of cultivate a specific way of doing things that then impacts on, on other types of sex. Um, so I think that's one thing is like to be mindful of. And I think all of us should try and like shake up how we have sex and what we're doing in our kind of sexual practice as you, as it were, as much as we can, because that, it should be a constant point of exploration. You don't want to just get into the same habit of doing the same thing. Um, but in terms of like it affecting your desire for a partner, I guess I'd have to ask like, if you're, if it is, is that because you're having more sexually satisfying times with yourself <laughs> and a sex toy than with a sexual partner? Because if that's the case, then I guess you have to ask yourself a couple questions of like one, one, why are you not bringing in perhaps that sex toy to your sex with a sexual partner? Because you might just be able to like elevate that partner mm. sex with a sex toy if that's what you're really like, liking using in your own personal time. Second of all, is that maybe a reflection of the fact that you aren't as sexually attracted to that partner? Mm. That could be the case, it might not be. Um, and then third of all, I guess it's also just thinking about are you communicating to your sexual partner what it is that you want and what you want from the sex enough again they can't read your mind and they can't read your body necessarily are you telling them what you really want to happen in that sexual context and if you're not maybe that's why you're finding that sexual the sex with the partner unfulfilling and feeling more sexually satisfied on your own with a sex toy well i hope that answers it yeah. and to wrap up this beautiful interview honestly i could speak to you for another two hours but we can do that we another do time that. yeah exactly so what would you say is your recipe for happiness in your life Exer ex exercise ex <laughs> exercise <laughs> okay Actually, yes movement i would not be happy without moving i exercise every day i walk everywhere i get my 10,000 steps minimum every day even if I have to walk home in the pouring rain at one in the morning, I will get those 10,000 steps wow. in. Um, I really think we have quite, the way that work lives are designed now, most of our work being online, on laptops, etc. I think we have quite a kind of stationary, stagnant day to day with our work. And I know that if I sit down for long periods of time, I am unhappy. Mm. I really don't like how it feels. So for me, movement is the number one thing that is a non-negotiable in my life every single day. I do not like moveless days. Mm. So my recipe for happiness is to move a lot and also to be, come back to the thing we were talking about earlier, stay inspired and stay curious. Surround us, surrounding myself, yourself, with people who make your brain feel bigger, who make you feel motivated to be the bestest version of yourself. Like I always think when I leave a conversation, like I did with Paul Branson the other day, with a reading list as long as my arm, feeling motivated to want to like soak up all the knowledge and information. Like you want to be having conversations like that that mm. make you want to be better and do more. And you don't just want to stay comfortable. Like you want, you don't, you know, you want people who, you know, who make you feel held, but you also want to be challenged. So I think staying really curious and staying inspired and then moving loads. Love that. Thank you so much, Emma. My pleasure. Thank Absolutely enjoyed this. Love Hello, friends. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to subscribe and share it with someone. I would love to hear your feedback and suggestions as to what guests you would like to see on the show next. See you next week.